Great, welcome to lecture 7. So we had quite a bit of discussion on scalars and fermions and we saw in particular they have different personalities. One is a spinless field, one is a field associated to spin half. Technically spin arises when you quantize the field so I should not be using words like spin for a classical field. But anyway, I think you know that I'm not doing classical field theory just for fun of it. It's in preparation of for quantizing. So we can use some words which uh, will have a meaning, uh, which have a meaning only in the quantum theory. We saw that uh, there are abelian symmetries, uh, namely symmetries like U1, that if I perform more than, if I perform two such transformations, so for example, I, a complex scalar goes to e to the i theta 1 phi and then supposing phi goes to e to the i theta 2 phi then the result is of course e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2 phi and this is also equal to also obtained by first doing e to the i theta 2 phi and then doing So both of these being exactly equal means that the two symmetry transformations commute with parameters <coughs> theta 1 and theta 2 and such a behavior is called abelian. Abelian just for our purposes just means commutative. So the group that is described in uh, that, that this symmetry transformation belongs to is U1 and U1 is an abelian group which means any two group operations can be performed in either order makes no difference. Now you already know that rotation group is not like that. If I perform a rotation ar ar around one axis and another axis or the other one first and then the first one I get different results and therefore uh, all these groups like ON and UN and SUN, SON these are all non-abelian. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that is, so this is one case, this is the other case where I say phi goes to, just to give an example, uh, O i j phi j. Now in these discussions I never wrote out, well I might have written, but we don't always have to write out O i j explicitly, but of course it depends on parameters. After all when uh, n is 3, then OIJ are nothing but the three rotation matrices. So obviously there are three Euler angles that you can rotate by. So OIJ depends on some parameters which we can call theta i. Okay. Now supposing I do this with theta 1 i, i runs over all the parameters of <coughs> ON, however many there might be. Okay. Supposing I do this transformation with an orthogonal matrix depending on the parameter th theta i1 and then I do it again If I do it uh, in this order, I get one answer, but in that answer I can't just add these thetas and those thetas, it's just not linear anymore. And that reflects in the fact that if I do it the other way, then I get theta i, these indices just run over all values, so I can call them whatever I want. But this is the label for the set. and. and these are not equal. Okay, this is a generalization to all orthogonal groups of a fact which you already know about the rotation group, SO3. So then the system is called non-abelian, the group is non-abelian 
and the symmetry is also called non abelian symmetry and both abelian and non abelian symmetries occur in nature uh, but they have somewhat different characteristics very important different characteristics and um, if you have already encountered the standard model of particle physics or if you are taking advanced particle physics now you will see that certain key symmetries are abelian certain other key symmetries are non abelian and uh, they have different effects on uh, the way nature behaves so it's very very important to distinguish these cases okay uh, this is just something that uh, i should have mentioned earlier now today the subject of our okay uh, before i leave this topic what i just said here for sca uh, scalars i wrote it as if these are scalars but you could just put in fermions and most of these things are still all these things i said are still true even if you have wild fermions where you do something different on left and right movers uh, it still remains true that if i do that thing when i do the sun transformation with some parameters theta 1 and theta 2 then they don't come in successive transformations don't come in okay so it's true as much for scalars as for fermions and it will also be true for vector fields which is the topic for today yes oh sorry i just uh, i use yeah left and right handed yeah not movers um there is a sense in which left and right handed particles are also left and right handed they right movers um uh, but uh, i probably shouldn't get into that here um if i was in two dimensions one one space one time then the only way a particle can move is plus x axis or minus x axis as time evolves and we refer to those as right movers and left movers and the point is that if it's a massless particle it doesn't have any intermediate choice since it has to move at the speed of light it is either moving at speed of light along plus x or along minus x and you can't get it to go from one to the other because there are no directions to rotate in so sometimes my mind reverts to one plus one dimensional physics and then we use this language it would be true of wild fermions in one plus one dimensions also massless wild fermions being massless they would have to propagate at the speed of light and then they could be only move one way or the other and in fact the dirac equation will tell us which way they move so that i i have promised to put some note in the in my class notes about two dimensions uh, i'll i'll do it when i have a little time okay good so today we are talking about vector fields i'm pretty sure you have studied these in your um, qft1 course but uh, we now we'll try to be a little more general so how do we think of a vector field so we typically write it a mu of x and t with mu going over 0 1 2 3 2. so like a spinner a vector is four component in four dimensions but actually that's a coincidence for example if i was in five dimensions a vector would be five component but a spinner would still be four component so the way spinner dimensions vary is some is a bit subtle and uh, not important for this discussion uh but in this case it's uh, but the point is that this index has a completely different meaning from the spinner index because under a lorentz transformation a mu goes to lambda mu nu a nu summed over nu where lambda is a matrix that satisfies lambda eta lambda transpose is eta which is the defining uh equation for the lorentz group lorentz transformation by definition is the linear transformation that preserves the minkowski metric you can write this equation out in components very easily but uh, i think this is good enough you should know this and the point is that uh, lambda transforms the coordinates that's the lorentz transformation which we learn by heart x goes to uh, 1 by square root 1 minus v squared by c squared x minus vt and so on uh, that's exactly what is encoded in lambda and the same way that coordinates transform these vectors transform there's a slight subtlety because we usually take coordinates to have an upper index mu and we usually take these vectors to have a lower index mu there's a good reason for that but uh, this is not the is not important to discuss it now 
Okay, so these are the these are what we uh, call vector fields, and of course in physics, uh, on quantizing a single vector field, we get a, a field that can be used to describe the photon. In which case, a zero is the scalar potential, and a one, two, three are the vector potential. Okay, and I don't know if this was clear to you in QFT one, but a is more fundamental than e and b. e and b are both functions of a. So a is the fundamental field, not e or b. Okay, good. Okay, now the question is what Lagrangian, what equations of motion do we want and what Lagrangian should we write? And that's pretty easy to answer. Uh, so the Maxwell equations, so we always start with a free theory in every uh, uh, class so far. I have uh, studied first the free theory and then put in interactions. In Maxwell's equations as they are traditionally taught, there is something on left side like di divergence of E or curl of B and something on right side in some of the equations like a density or a current. In field theory it can't be like that because there is nothing like an external density or current. If there is a current it also comes from field theory. Okay? So it is just a field equation, Maxwell's equation will have to be a field equation. And probably if you have done uh, quantum electrodynamics, you have seen that field equation. So the electric current there comes from the electron field. Okay. Uh, but we can summarize all the equations in the form del mu f mu nu equals 0, where f is just the four-dimensional curl of A. In uh, school, you would have learned the three-dimensional curl of a vector. You do it by taking an anti-symmetrized derivative and then take, put multiplying by an epsilon symbol uh, to get a vector, actually axial vector out of it. But uh, here is the four curl and there is no way to make it into a vector. It just has two indices. Okay? This kind of curl can be defined for any vector in any number of dimensions. Just take the vector take a gradient in an arbitrary direction and then anti-symmetrize in these two indices. So that is the curl. Okay. So this form of the equations, source-free Maxwell's equations are known to you? People are nodding. Good. Okay. Now what action or what Lagrangian do they come from? Well, the Lagrangian that is correct and correctly normalized is this one uh, where I will explain the minus one for a little bit later. But uh, this should be clear, you take f and you raise two indices using etas and then you contract them like this. And if you vary this to get the Euler-Lagrange equations, you get that. Hmm? Importantly, you always keep in mind that f is this function of a and it is a which you vary. Good. Now, where did we get this equation from? We got it from Mr. Maxwell. It is actually a very compact way of writing his equations. Okay. Uh, actually, I suppose you have been through this, but the, there are actually eight Maxwell equations, two vector equations and two scalar, but four of them are just constraint equations which are trivially true for, uh, for f mu nu and the other four are these equations. Okay? Uh, if you are not sure about this, you better, you may want to revise that. Uh, the ones which are trivially true are the equation which says del mu f mu lambda fully anti-symmetrized is zero. This is the statement that the curl of a curl is zero, okay? Which uh, or sort of, uh, yeah, maybe I maybe that doesn't sound right, but uh, something, yeah, I think it is true. Yeah, curl of a curl. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so this is a that is all the three-dimensional story. That's because in three dimensions, after taking the curl, you made it into a vector. Now it's the divergence. Really, what what that divergence of curl, which is zero in three D, is really curl of curl. If you define curl as a tensor instead of taking the orthogonal vector to it. Hmm? So anyway, uh, this is obviously true by symmetry of derivatives. So if you plug in this thing into that, you get zero. And this is the del dot b equation and the del cross e equation. Okay. While the del cross b equation and the del dot e equation uh, <coughs> are included in this. Okay. But what if we didn't know Maxwell's equations? Supposing we didn't know them, and supposing we had just done a 
course on QFT2 and we had been told for seven, six lectures about scalar and fermion fields and now we were trying to generalize whatever we learnt to vector fields. So what would we guess for the equations of motion and for the Lagrange? Well, the first guess would be, well, um, these are, this is a four component object. Klein-Gordon equation is satisfied by a single scalar. Maybe these four components satisfy four Klein-Gordon equations. In other words, a uh, box of a mu equals zero one equation for each component. We might have guessed this. Okay? And if we guess this, we could also find a Lagrangian for it. The so Lagrangian would simply be that. Okay? Now, what happens if we make this assumption and then make take this Lagrangian and then try to quantize the system? Um, in this course, we'll be quantizing using the path integral, but in your last course, you quantized using canonical commutation relations. So let's do that. Let's just follow the rules as blindly as we can. So as you know, pi of uh, pi mu is the variation of L with respect to A mu dot. And mu can take the value 0, 1, 2, 3. So when mu is 0, that's exactly when we have a dot. And so the conjugate of a dot is again a dot. No surprise, because after all, this is how Klein-Gordon equation also works. The canonical momentum uh, conjugate to phi is del L by del phi dot, and it's phi dot. So this is following the same rules. OK, good. I'll come back to this. I have to erase it to continue. Fine. Now, uh, the rules of canonical commutation at equal time say that I should take a mu at x and t and pi mu at x prime and the same t equal time commutation relation. And I should write something here which has a del which has an i and it has a delta 3 of x minus x prime. But now, unlike the Klein-Gordon case, obviously I have uh, mu and new indices, and so I have to put something, and it better be Lorentz invariant. Otherwise, when I rotate these by Lorentz transformation, I'll get some nonsense. So I put delta mu mu. Okay. Now I plug in what pi is, and I also will. This is a comma. This is a commutator. And I also will now lower the this index with the eta. So this will be a dot lambda. And this again will be i, this time mu lambda, and same delta function. OK. Now what is the next step in canonical commutation relations? It is to take these and expand them in oscillator modes and ask that these commutators, what do they tell us about the oscillators? And each A will have, A mu will have some oscillators, small A mu. And so we'll get a, for the oscillators with index mu and wave number k. So we are going to make a Fourier decomposition. I don't have to tell you, we have done this many times. So A mu k with A dagger mu k prime will be delta k k prime and again eta mu mu. Okay. For the oscillators. Now we have an embarrassment because what is eta? It has one plus and three minus signs. Okay. So the A0 oscillators are just like harmonic oscillators. A0 with A0 dagger is just one, or delta of k, k prime. So for each k, it's one harmonic oscillator. But when mu is one, two, or three, this is minus. And so for mu equals one, two, or three, we have a, a dagger equals minus one for each component. 
this is not good because um, you know that when it's plus one, uh, then or h bar, whatever, uh, then you can construct this while other operators, you can construct states of increasing energy. But if it's minus one, then you end up constructing states of more and more negative energy. So it's not going to look good. Okay, so um, this is a problem. Why did we get stuck with this minus sign? Because of Lorentz invariance, because of that eta. Now you could be clever and say, well, instead of saying the ground state is annihilated by A, I'll take it to be annihilated by A dagger. That will reverse the roles of these two. I'll reverse the sign <coughs> order and then I'll get plus one and I'll be good. A will create excited states and A dagger will lower me. Problem is, after a Lorentz transformation, these A's for I mu equals one, two, three, will mix with the case of mu equals zero, where I need the conventional ordering. So you can't play games with the time and space components of anything separately because Lorentz invariance says that I can smoothly convert time and space into each other by a boost up to some extent. Okay, so there's really a problem. You can also have one more idea, bright idea, which is which does help a little bit actually and goes in the right direction. You could say, well, I never was forced to choose this. I could have chosen this to be minus from the beginning. In that case, this is minus. In that case, at least I have saved the A's for mu equals one, two, and three. Only the mu equals zero are bad. Okay, so, but, So it's still a problem, we haven't solved the problem, but at least we have uh, fixed it to some extent that the ones which are space component indices, those seem to behave better. The ones with the time component index still a, a minus sign. Okay. What happens when oscillators have this minus sign then is that the theory is unphysical. So whichever sign you choose there, the theory is unphysical and in particular non-unitary. Now, there are many kinds of non-unitary behavior, but this is the worst one, okay? The Hamiltonian is actually unbounded below, and there's nothing much you can do about it, okay? So, all your probabilities will disappear down, yes? Right, so here it seems like uh, the Hamiltonian is unbounded. It's always unbounded, whichever sign I take over all. But when we look at the Lagrangian, if we take the Hamiltonian density, that should be similar to... No. If we... Uh, so it should be similar to a scalar one with just the... Except that because of these contractions, the pi, so there will be four pi's, right? These. So again in the Hamiltonian you will see that when you have pi 0 squared and pi 1 squared, pi 2 squared, pi 3 squared, I could have actually bypassed this whole discussion and said, look, the Hamiltonian has to contain pi mu x mu dot minus L. Finally, it will contain half pi mu pi mu. Now pi mu pi mu is such a thing that again it is pi 0 squared minus pi 3 vector squared or other way around. Either way there is a minus sign. Now one can keep looking for ways out of this minus sign but remember that this is a, the whole point of special relativity is that one of the space time coordinates is time which has a minus sign relative to the other three. Okay, that is to say the, the interval that is invariant under Lorentz transformations is dt squared minus dx squared. Lorentz transformations are exactly those transformations which have to keep this interval unchanged. And if you see this interval is zero for light, <coughs> which is exactly the statement that light always travels at speed one in my units. If I put c squared in here, you will see that this equation gives me dx by dt is equal to c, which is exactly what light satisfies and it has to satisfy it in all frames. So this minus sign is not something we can fudge or play around with. It's really there in special relativity. So we are stuck for a reason which is given to us by special relativity. It's not just some accident. It's not that we aren't smart enough, but clearly this uh, action we guessed is wrong. This, this equation of motion is wrong, so is this action. Now, on the other hand, Maxwell has given us an action which was derived as equation of motion which is derived from experiment. So it can't be wrong, it can't be non-unitary, it can't be unphysical, it's just absolutely correct. Okay. So what did his equation do better than this equation? That's really the question. Yeah. So what is non-unitary? 
Non-unitary means that as time evolves, the probabilities are not conserved. Okay. It's a bit of a step from what I have done to say non-unitary, but I think it's enough to say for now that we have negative probabilities. Okay. Negative probabilities is the word that uh, for me I'm describing by non-unitary. That you agree that it's negative probability. Actually, uh, I didn't show you that, but supposing we take this convention where A0 and A0 dagger is minus 1, then the norm of the state A0 dagger on the vacuum is this, and this is equal to minus 1. Okay, the norm of this state is this state times its dagger. A0 with A0 dagger, I use this relation. I get the other way which vanishes because A0 kills the vacuum and the extra term is minus 1 and the vacuum is normalized, so I get minus 1. Hmm? So this is the negative probability, negative norm. This is the unphysical nature of the theory. Good. So now we better call up Maxwell and ask for his help and say that our effort to guess <coughs> the right equation was a failure. His equation is the correct one. And what is it? And why is it better? Let's see. This is his equation. Okay. Well, part of it looks exactly like, like our equation. But the other part has a term like this. So it's not box of a nu equals 0. It's box of a nu minus this extra thing is 0. Okay. So it's a different equation. And now let's ask ourselves, what are the canonical momenta here? And follow the same steps and see what happens when we try to quantize. Okay. So phi mu is again del L by del A mu dot. Okay. Where will I find A mu dot in, uh, okay. So sorry, before I do this, I should write the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian we already wrote is this. Okay, now it's an easy exercise to note that since mu and nu independently run over 0, 1, 2, 3, but also f is anti-symmetric, so if I uh, focus on the first index mu, I can write out the term separately. So minus 1 fourth f0 um, mu f0 nu, and then minus 1 fourth f i nu f I. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's right now minus because these things are up and down. Now I realize when I do this, I've just broken the mu summation, but I realize that this contains a term when mu is zero. Okay, so this this in turn is minus one fourth f i j f i j minus one fourth f i zero f i zero which is the same as this one. Why? Because in this one, nu cannot be 0. By anti-symmetry, there is no 0, 0. So this I can just replace by i. And now I can see that this is exactly the same as this. It looks like I have reversed the indices, but if I reverse both the indices, I don't get any sign. So it's these are the same. And so the final answer is minus half f0 i, f0 i minus 1 fourth f i j, so that's my Lagrangian written out in components. Okay. Now what is pi? The canonical momentum. <coughs> well, pi is again delta L by delta A mu dot. And now I have to ask what is, where is a mu dot contained in this? Well, no dot can be contained here because this is i and j space indices. So none of these can contain any time derivative. Time derivatives are all in this term. Okay. This term contains f0 i contains del 0 a i, which is a i dot. What about a0 dot? Where is it? a i dot I found where i is 1, 2, 3. Where is a0 dot? not there. It's gone. It's vanished. So I conclude that first of all that pi is f0 mu 
and this in turn implies that pi i is a uh, i dot and pi 0 is 0. Now if pi 0 is 0, then it means the canonical momentum of the component A0 is vanishing. So there cannot be any canonical commutator pi 0 with A0. This can't be there because there is no pi 0. Pi 0 is just identically 0. Okay. That means that even though I thought the Lagrangian has a four vector A0, A1, A2, A3, but A0, although it's a field, doesn't con correspond to a dynamical variable. Unless I can quantize it, it's not going to be a dynamical variable that does anything. Okay. So A0 is not dynamical. And at least one of our headaches, in fact, the main headache, just went away because if it's not dynamical then there is no commutator of pi 0 with a 0 then I can never get oscillators a 0 in the first place let alone that they would satisfy a 0 with a 0 dagger is minus 1. I just don't get them they are not there. Where did they go? Well there are two terms this term certainly has a 0 dot okay uh, a, uh, well I shouldn't be looking in the equations of motion I should look in the Lagrangian. But basically, there are two terms in, in this. So you can actually write this minus half del mu a nu del mu a nu and then plus half del mu a nu del mu a nu. I should have done this in a more tidy way, but it's very easy to expand this out like this. And here you see that whenever there's an a0 dot, here also there's an a0 dot squared and they just cancel each other. It's because of this extra term, which is because of this extra term in the equation. So it's because we didn't take the klein gordon equation, but we had this extra term dictated by Maxwell. That's why A0 went away, uh, A0 dot went away, and therefore uh, we are sort of saved. So this is good news. So it does mean that something is better about this. And now the deep question is to understand what is really going on. It can't be just some coincidence, there must be some kind of rule. And the origin of this strange situation is lies in the property of this Lagrangian, which I'll move upstairs. Which is that if A mu goes to A mu plus a 4 gradient of some function lambda, then f mu nu goes to itself. I hope this is obvious because it's a curl of A and A is gradient. This one at least looks like your familiar curl of gradient is 0. So f doesn't change. If f doesn't change, then the Lagrangian doesn't change. And this is a situation we have not seen before. So you might say this is a symmetry of the theory. Okay. But it's not quite like a symmetry. What are the symmetries we saw so far? They were symmetries where you take a field and you do something to it involving a parameter. Maybe you multiply it by some parameter or you add some. Remember, we also had axionic symmetry where you add something. But always those parameters were constant. Okay. This is not a constant parameter. Rather, it's an entire field. It's not, I'm not saying it's a particle, but it is a scalar field. By definition, a field is a function of space and time, which it is. And it is a scalar under Lorentz transformations if you want to preserve this equation after Lorentz transformation, because this gradient already transforms as a vector. So lambda cannot also transform. So it's a scalar. Okay. So the symmetry is by transformation by an entire field. This is a new thing. I'm just saying it's new compared with anything which we saw in the case of scalars and fermions. Okay. And what we'll see is that very roughly this field is like the fact that the theory doesn't depend on this field is like taking away a degree of freedom from A nu. And that degree of freedom you can think of as A0. Of course, it's not so simple and we have to do a little bit work and of work and we'll do it now. But very conceptually, when there's a symmetry, 
which involves an entire field, then that field can be used to take away something from my original field. And so, we have a situation which goes by the name of redundancy. A mu of x appears to describe four fields. but actually describes less. What is the number less? Well, the possible less is uh, could be 3 or it could be 2 and as we will see and we will derive it, sometimes it is 3 and sometimes it is 2. It depends on a few other things which we have to develop, but it is never 4. And what is the one that goes? It's always A0. And that's the one which was problematic. Okay. If you remember how the vector potential and scalar potential uh, appeared in, uh, in waves, in the electromagnetic waves, um, the three components of the vector potential correspond to the vibrations of the wave in three possible directions in space. What on earth would be the zero component of a four vector potential? It would be vibration in time. What does it mean vibration in time? It doesn't make any sense. Something can vibrate in space. That means as time evolves, the thing moves around in space. That's called vibration. There's nothing like as time evolves, some physical object vibrates in time along the time axis. But that's exactly what A0 was. It was a vibration along the time axis. So it has to be nonsensical. and because of gauge invariance, it is actually nonsensical and we will get rid of it. Okay. So, all the problem of gauge symmetry or as, as it is called or gauge invariance which is a better term uh, is to understand this uh, strange uh, situation where we have four components of a vector field but at least one of them is never physical. And the root cause, the one way to see it is that in the free action there is no A0 dot but a deeper way to see it is that there is a gauge invariance and now we will start using that gauge invariance to do things and reduce the system to its basic degrees of freedom. Now you could ask why did not we start with the basic degrees of freedom, why are we doing all this rigmarole and very often it looks like uh, gauge symmetry or gauge invariance is kind of a nuisance like it is something that we seem to be stuck with and do, uh, have to do it and so that we can uh, you know end up with the with maxwell's theory in a quantum version but it and and probably people didn't understand it fully in the beginning but turns out that it's absolutely necessary for the following reason it has to resolve so gauge invariance resolves a paradox between two things. One is Lorentz invariance and the other is unitarity. We saw the naive version of this paradox right in the beginning. If you have Lorentz invariance, you have A0, A1, A2, A3, but quantizing them, one of them at least has negative norm and so you lose unitarity. But if I say, well, that means I didn't want A0 in my theory then I may have unitarity, but now I can't have Lorentz invariance because if I take a vector whose A0 component is 0 and I do a Lorentz transformation, it's come back. I can't keep it away. Okay, So then I can't have Lorentz invariance. So there's a paradox between these two, a clash, and it is resolved by a very subtle uh, behavior, which is gauge invariance, which allows us to have this and also have this. In, in some sense, I am repeating things that you have learned, but I, I have a feeling that this was not emphasized. This is not normally emphasized even in textbooks, but it is sort of the key to gauge theory, and so it is very important to do it. Okay. Now, uh, one more comment is that I considered this theory, but I never put any mass term, and why not? Now it becomes clear to me or clear to all of us why there can't be a mass term because if I did put a mass term m squared by 2 a mu a mu certainly looks like a mass term I don't know if I want plus or minus I'll pick any sign 
at random but you can see two things one is that again if the sine of m squared is the one i want right in klein gordon this should be minus m squared phi squared that's the correct sign to get a positive potential but because this has one positive and three negative terms i'll never get a positive potential for all of them either three of them or one of them will have an unbounded below potential same problem and another problem is that gauge invariance is destroyed because if i shift the field by gradient of lambda this stays the same but this definitely does not stay the same now again this is a amazing fact which is responsible for something in nature which is quite uh, quite fundamental to our existence the fact that light uh, propagates over large distances and doesn't attenuate is due to the fact that the photon has no mass okay uh, that's why we can see the light of the sun or any other thing the sun is also giving off gluons and w bosons and z bosons but since those are all have they all have some mass the distance they effectively travel uh, in the form of radiation is of the order of inverse their mass so whatever mass they have that cuts off their propagation at some point exponentially and so we don't see w boson light coming out from the sun but we do see photon light we also now know that you can see gravitational wave radiation from appropriate sources and that particle is also massless and actually it's for the same reason there's a gauge invariance in gravity which forces the graviton to be massless and that's why gravitational waves are long range now the thing is experimentally you cannot say that the photon is massless you can only keep measuring its mass and saying well it must be less than this much less than this much get better and better but theory says that look as soon as you put a mass uh, of any amount however small your theory will go to hell because uh, it will not be unitary anymore so it better be exactly massless okay i am kind of spinning little bit naive version of the story but it's pretty close to the full story so uh, exactly massless and having gauge invariance and therefore having unitarity these sort of go together all right okay are there questions up to this point yes when we add this a mu and u term mm. our uh, phi not is still going to be zero because there is no yes zero. that's certainly true but then a not is going to be there so when we write an a not phi not as two dynamical variables in a permutation basis right? no phi not is still zero so like my question is why is one of them identically zero but the second one still sort of in the lagrangian yeah it just that, that's how it is even if we add it in the lagrangian as long as we don't add it with a time derivative it doesn't become dynamical so like there is like 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 basically what i mean, uh, mean to ask is that one of the dynamical vari- uh, by the way it's not that a not is not there in this huh? it's a not dot is not there but gradient spatial gradient of a not is there in this oh, okay. hmm gradient del del by del x i of a not is there in this is not that a not was vanishing completely from the lagrangian only its time derivative is vanishing space derivatives are there. now if you add this term now a not itself is there not differentiated doesn't make anything better or worse from the point of view of commutation relation because phi not stays zero but what it does is it destroys this invariance which as we'll see slowly is uh, crucial to uh, maintaining uh, unitarity of the theory but there are subtleties and from now on it becomes bit of a minefield and we'll try to go through it as carefully as we can okay so faced with this situation the question now we should ask is okay let's say we have this lagrangian how do we actually see that the claims i am making are true for example that i can remove uh, a0 using the gauge invariance so i'm keeping this a uh, lagrangian and i'm keeping the symmetry like this and now what can i do using it well So I think in my notes I've got this small lambda. By the way, I want to stress again that if lambda were constant, then there's nothing. Huh? It's it's important that lambda should be a function. So the fact that lambda is a field, as I called it, is very crucial to this whole discussion. Good. 
Now, uh, this is a symmetry of that for any lambda. Okay, you may say, well, there might be some restrictions on lambda. For example, if A was chosen to fall off at infinity, then lambda should also fall off at infinity appropriately. Otherwise, after doing this, the new A may not fall off at infinity. So, we have to be a little careful with boundary effects. Okay, but uh, we'll do that if we need. But apart from that, lambda is an arbitrary function. So, we can say that in our minds, it's arbitrary except that it falls off at infinity. Okay. Now, let's choose a lambda in a particular way. What we'll do is, we'll take a configuration a mu, given one, and now we'll go to a new one, which is a mu plus del mu lambda, where lambda is chosen exactly so that it cancels a0. How will we do that? Well, we'll take a0 that was given to us. Let's evaluate it at x and some coordinate t prime and integrate it over t prime from 0 to t. You can take this lower limit to be anything you like. Okay. Uh, if I choose, so this is a function of now of x and t. Okay. So this had t prime dependence, I integrated it from 0 to t, so this has dependence on x and t. And I choose this and I make a gauge transformation with this. Well, from this, I find that del 0 of lambda is equal to, I just differentiate this with respect to t, t is the upper endpoint. So the answer is the integrand evaluated at the upper endpoint, namely a0 of x and t. Okay. And therefore, after I perform a mu goes to a mu plus del mu lambda, so let's this time let's write it a mu prime is a mu plus, this is maybe a better way to say it, then a0 prime is 0 by this choice. Hmm. It's not a unique choice because I could have moved my lower end point around here and there, but uh, fact remains that it sets a0 prime prime equals 0. That's the only job it had. Okay. And of course, it will affect the other components of A, but so what? We didn't, we just took some arbitrary con configuration. What we've shown is that if somebody gives me a function A0, A1, A2, A3, then I can give you a new function A0 prime, A1 prime, A2 prime, A3 prime, which has the same physics because the Lagrangian is uh, invariant under gauge transformation and in which A0 prime vanishes. So I can do it. Okay. Now, after this, does my theory have any invariance? Yes. So in the previous Lagrangian, hmm. we had an axionic kind of uh, symmetry, right? Uh, mu plus constant. Ah, uh, plus lambda mu. Yeah. So actually, the so problem we there. A, uh, so we choose something to get rid of the you know the. Yeah. Uh, first of all, no, because that was not a function. That was a constant at best, not function. We, A0 is a function. We want to get rid of a whole function. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I told you that lambda being a field, it can eat up one of our fields, and this is exactly how it can be chosen to do that. Okay? But there's another problem, which is that there's really no axionic symmetry because there's no concept of a constant four vector in Lorentz uh, in, 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 in Minkowski space-time because under a Lorentz transformation, it will change. So it will basically break Lorentz invariance. It's like choosing a preferred space-time direction, and that we can't do. So scalars can shift by a constant, but vectors, spinners, and all just cannot. Good. Now, um, <coughs> now the interesting thing is that we can still perform the transformation a i, oh sorry, a i goes to, or a i prime equals a i plus del i of lambda. And why is that? Now I'm going to choose, after I've done that, now I'll choose a lambda which only depends on x and not t. Okay, because if, if lambda is so, then a 0 prime is a 0 plus del 0 of lambda which depends only on x and not t, and this term is therefore 0. So, I'm performing a further gauge transformation, which doesn't spoil my previous choice of gauge. 
Yes. So this, this is essentially like AI double prime equal to AI prime. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so one very important thing is there was nothing sacred about the initial choice. Okay. So you see, this is why if we keep doing equations very systematically, we'll get so many primes in our equations that we'll never know where they are. Hmm? Let's say it in words. I start with an arbitrary configuration. I perform a chosen gauge transformation. I set A0 prime to zero. The other three are now arbitrary. Therefore, I could have started with an arbitrary configuration where A0 was zero and AI were anything. Now I'm starting with that configuration. Hmm? When we do path integrals, we'll be integrating over all field configurations. And then it will become even easier to understand what's going on. But we simply should, it is true, what you said is true, that if, if I do all this and keep track of primes, then with respect to my original choice, a mu prime is the one which has this zero, and these are double prime in terms of prime. It's not wrong, just that we don't write it. Okay? So, in other words, we, are still, we still have the freedom of... <coughs> time-dependent, time-independent gauge transformations. Okay. And now, uh, <coughs> before we try to fix this, let's notice something about the equations of motion. So, one of the equations of motion is del i f 0 i equals 0. Do you know what this is in Maxwell's language? Del dot e. Yeah. Now let's write it after we have gone to the gauge where A0 is 0. Okay. This is del 0 AI minus del I A0, but A0 is not there. So this is AI dot. Okay. So this says that del I of AI dot is 0, which is the same as saying that d by dt of del dot A. is 0, just by interchanging the dot and the del by del x i. Okay? This tells me that for my remaining gauge field, which has only three components, if I can make its divergence 0 at the initial time, it will remain 0 for all time. So let me try to make its divergence 0 at the initial time. Okay? I could have a pursued a different goal. I could have pursued the goal of saying, well, I made A0 equal to 0. Now I'll use these to make another component, say A1 or 2 or 3 to be 0. And I'll be left with 2. It's not wrong. It's just not the cleverest thing to do. By the way, if I did that, I would actually take the 3 component and set it to 0. And then the electromagnetic wave propagating in the 3 direction would have transverse oscillations. You can work that out. But uh, it could be useful for some problems. But here, we learn that del dot A is a nice thing to focus on. So now our goal will be to make that 0 by a gauge transformation. And that's pretty easy because under this gauge transformation, I forgot to set my alarm, so make sure I get out of here in the next two minutes. So, uh, if I take the divergence of this, I find that del i a i prime is equal to del i a i plus del squared lambda. And it's this which I want to set to 0. Okay, Given a configuration a i, I can calculate del i of a i, that's same as del dot a. And I want to find lambda such that this whole thing is 0. So what equation should I solve? It's Poisson equation, del squared lambda equals minus del i s. Okay. <coughs> now, you know that under suitable boundary conditions and everything, uh, there will be some function lambda which does this. So, we are not going to go into details. There are many subtleties about this, especially if space-time is not some simple space-time, but something more complicated. But even in simple ones, there are subtleties. But broadly speaking, we recognize this as Poisson equation with a source given by divergence of A that I start with. And if I find lambda appropriately, then I'll be able to set this to 0. And once I set it to 0, 
it will stay zero because of this equation. That's the brilliance of this. So the combined effect is that we can use gauge invariance to get a mu equals zero and a with a constraint that a is divergenceless. Okay, but I have to keep remembering this constraint. I'm not going to solve this constraint because that would be non-local. It's a differential constraint. If I want to find A3, I have to take del 1 A1 plus del 2 A2 and then divide by del 3. I can do it in moment in Fourier space, but it's a tricky business. It's non-local. Huh? So I, it's not convenient to solve that, but uh, just if I keep it in mind, then this is the final configuration and I can work with this. And this choice is called Coulomb gauge. It's a gauge very well adapted to studying electrostatic problems uh, and more gen and uh, static problems because A0 is out of the way. And uh, yeah, just that. What is non-local gauge? If I try to eliminate one of these A's in favor of the other two, that would be non-local. How do you eliminate, how will you eliminate A3 from this equation? This equation is del 1 A1 plus del 2 A2 plus del 3 A3 equals 0. Now take del 3 A3 on the other side. That means del by del Z of A3. Then the original side we know, del 1 A1 plus del 2 A2. Now del 3 A3, I want to find A3 from that. So I have to integrate in DZ. So it's non-local. Hmm? So one of them, it won't be 0. I can't insist that one of them must be 0. Okay, I can only insist that one of them is dependent on the other two and that's very hard to solve. Okay, with that I'll stop and uh, we'll see you next week and uh, we are not doing Mondays anymore. So we'll see you on Tuesday, but we'll also try to do Wednesday of next week according to the feedback that you all give. If there's no, any of you doesn't give feedback by tomorrow, I'll simply take the decision anyway. So if you want your convenience to be counted, please do give that feedback about your timing on Wednesday. Okay, thank you.